All right, friends, it is 11 o'clock, so we can go ahead and get started with our program. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Science of SpongeBob Humans in Bikini Bottom. My name is Michelle Venegas, and we are so glad to have you with us today. So thanks to the support from our friends over at Nickelodeon, every Tuesday and Thursday this month, a museum educator from the Natural History Museum will be hosting fun, educational, kid-friendly conversations with marine experts from our museum and beyond, covering a variety of topics like uh, sea snails like Gary, prehistoric sponges, and how we can protect our oceans. So we'll be hanging out today for about 45 minutes with the last 15 minutes of our program dedicated to questions from y'all. Um, so in our program today, we're going to get the opportunity to hang out with our friends from Heal the Bay. So are you ready, kids? I can't hear you. So unfortunately, I really can't hear you because we are on a <laughs> webinar. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that we can't hear from you today. So if you have a question or a comment that you'd like to add, you can go ahead and use the chat function in Zoom. To, uh, to ask your question and we can go ahead and answer that question at the end of the program today. All right, so allow me to properly introduce myself. My name is Michelle Venegas, like I said, and I am a museum educator at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. And hanging out with me today are my very good friends from Heal the Bay. We have Jenna and Tiki. So Jenna, Jenna and Tiki, tell us a little bit about yourselves. Absolutely. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Jenna Siegel. I'm the Associate Director of Programs here at Heal the Bay Aquarium. Uh, I manage all of our public education. Um, I'm a liaison for our, our city uh, contacts and, and partners, and um, just really excited to be here. Hi, everybody. My name is Tiki, and I am one of the education coordinators as well as the camp coordinator here at the aquarium. I'm responsible for gathering together all the awesome education programs with our education team and working with young scholars like you all out there. Awesome. Well, it's so great to have you both with us today for our program. And for those of you at home, if you didn't know that there is a Heal the Bay Aquarium uh, right off the Santa Monica Pier. So you can go visit Tiki and Jenna uh, at some point and take a look at the cool sea creatures that they have at the aquarium there. So Heal the Bay is an organization that's based here in the greater Los Angeles area. So can you tell us a little bit more about some of the work that Heal the Bay does? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Heal the Bay, we are an environmental nonprofit. Um, we are dedicated to making our coastal waters and inland waters safe, healthy, and clean, not only for us, but for the animals that call it home. Um, and we are at Heal the Bay Aquarium, which is our teaching center. So you get to learn all about local animals. They are basically our marine neighbors in the sea. Uh, learn about the, all of the incredible um, biology that we have right off our coast and learn how we're affecting these animals, our human impact, and what we can do um, to help protect those animals and the ocean as a whole. Awesome. Sounds like really cool and really important work that you both do at Heal the Bay. So. Humans interact with beaches and coastlines and oceans in a variety of ways, right? Maybe some of you go to the beach uh, to enjoy the water when it's too hot. Uh, maybe you go fishing, maybe you go tide pooling. So we utilize these ecosystems in a lot of different ways. And it's clear that through our interactions with these uh, environments, um, we're impacting them in some ways. Uh, and we can see that in the SpongeBob universe, the residents of Bikini Bottom are also being impacted by human activity. So today, Jenna, Tiki, and I are gonna be taking a look at some of the different ways that humans have impacted the residents of Bikini Bottom um, and in what ways we can help lessen that impact uh, and the impact that we have on these aquatic communities. So let's explore how humans impact Bikini Bottom. Uh, and we're gonna start by looking at how residents of Bikini Bottom are using man-made items. So we have a few examples here. You can see in this image, we have a fish who is using a discarded hair comb uh, for his tractor to plant some plants. I actually just watched that episode for the first time yesterday. It was really, it was really something. <laughs> it's from, I think, season 11. So one of the newer episodes. Um, we can take a look here at this picture of SpongeBob's living room and see that he actually has um, fishing lures and fish hooks in his living room as decor right here on the wall and as his little table for his conch phone. Um, Mr. Krabs's house is actually an old discarded anchor from a ship or from a boat. So you can see that there. And interestingly, the Krusty Krab restaurant itself is a lobster trap. 
So these are just some of the ways that in the SpongeBob universe in Bikini Bottom, we see uh, the residents of Bikini Bottom using our man-made items. So Jenna and Tiki, can you tell us a little bit more about how we see animals in the wild using man-made items? Absolutely. So you may know, just as you mentioned earlier, our aquarium is actually built here underneath the Santa Monica Pier, which is actually a man-made habitat meaning there are creatures that live under the pier. And we have an actual exhibit here that actually exhibits animals that live under that pier right behind me. Some animals that you may find there are some of our coastal sharks, like our, uh, uh, excuse me, our, uh, what are those guys called? I just- Leopard sharks? Brain. Horn sharks, there you go. Horn sharks. Horn sharks. Uh, also leopard sharks, other animals like that that are lower lying to the substrate or the bottom of the ground. Also, you'll find mussels and perch and even sand crabs. And all of these animals make this part of the ocean their habitat because they can use the man-made structures like the pylons and stuff like that, the pylons and stuff, and also other logs and things that may have been there from our actual use of that pier. But the unfortunate thing, as you just made mention of, is that SpongeBob is not that far from the actual truth. There are actual things that end up in the ocean that necessarily should be there, such as pollution, plastics, and things like that. Even animal traps, as you may have seen with the crust or the uh, yeah, the crusty crab there. And sometimes animals can make use of that, but a lot of times they cannot. And a lot of times those items actually can cause more harm. It help. And so you may have heard of artificial reefs and things like that. Those are examples where people have actually made a, a good impact by creating natural habitats or uh, man-made habitats for these animals to be able to live, thrive, and survive. But also that pollution is a bad human impact that actually causes harm to those environments for many, many, many years to come. So yeah, it's a kind of Double-edged sword, as they say, or too crit of the crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting that it can kind of swing to both sides where humans can create these man-made structures specifically for sea creatures like these man-made reefs, um, or even if we're creating structures for ourselves that then the animals can use, like the pylons at the pier. Um, and then on the other hand, you have you know, issues with pollution where things like plastics and trash and things that we discard end up in the ocean and the animals end up using them in a way that is not great for them, uh, which you can see, we have a couple pictures here. There's a hermit crab using a Duplo block <laughs> as a shell. Um, and then we've got a picture of our seahorse here using its little tail to hold on to a Q-tip. That's actually a really, a really famous image um, that we've included here. Yeah, and I'm actually glad that you mentioned that because we do have a seahorse exhibit here. And as you can see, one of our friends is just hanging around upside down. And a lot of people don't realize how small a lot of the animals of the ocean are. And so one of the major things, and as you look at that Q-tip there, you'll note that the actual uh, seahorse is holding on to the actual plastic tip or the plastic uh, connector of that, that cotton swab. So as the cotton will biodegrade eventually because it's a natural fiber, that actual plastic that the little seahorse is hanging on to will be there for centuries, causing pollution and harm because um, plastics polar or uh, solar degrade. They uh, degrade with the sun over time. They just break down into very small, small, fine pieces. And over time, other animals may pick up those pieces thinking that they're food or in turn, sometimes that plastic breaks down. And as we know with certain things that we have had that are plastic, it can leach. And so when that leach is out, we have a problem much bigger than that because that can cause all kinds of problems because animals are subject to a lot of the health conditions that we have like cancer and things like that. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting and really important to know as well that you know the things that we use on our everyday life that we use one time and we throw away, they persist. They will exist on this planet much, much, much longer than we will. Think about every toothbrush that you've ever used in your life. That toothbrush still exists somewhere in a landfill, hopefully not in the ocean. Um, so it's important to remember that when we're using these items, we have choices that we can make. We can buy the plastic or we can buy the bamboo or the wood products like for, for cotton swabs that might break down more quickly or more readily. So 
Thank you so much for that information. Thank All you. right, let's take a look at our next slide here. Our next topic, we're gonna talk about PPE pollution. All right, so PPE stands for Personal Protective Equipment, and it's been a major part of our lives over the last year and a half. So throughout the pandemic, I know personally, I have seen so many discarded masks and gloves all over the ground in the streets and in parking lots. And it's really upsetting because the storm drains here in Los Angeles, they lead directly to the ocean. Um, so I thought it was really fitting to talk about PPE for this presentation um, and how it affects marine life because in the SpongeBob universe, they have, <clears throat> excuse me, their very own glove world. <laughs> um, so Jenna and Tiki, can you tell us a little bit more about how PPE pollution specifically is affecting marine life? Absolutely. So yeah, um, we, if you look at the slide that's there, we have our top 10. So Heal the Bay, we do a coastal cleanup day every year. We hosted coastal cleanup month last year because uh, everything was virtual to keep everyone as safe as possible. Um, we have a top 10 of items that are common, commonly collected trash items. Um, that we find just on our beaches and in our inland communities. And uh, you'll notice that number 10, for the first time ever in our cleanup history, PPE has now made our top 10. And you'll notice a very common theme between all of the items on there. Most of them, uh, I'd say a good portion of them, are all made out of plastic items. So that is a really big problem that we have. Um, in the last year alone, um, because of the pandemic, at, there was, a, I think, between a 250 to 300% increase in single-use plastics. And 30% uh, of that is PPE. So those are the masks, the gloves. Um, and it's important um, to protect our health and protect the health of those around us. Um, but what we need to be mindful of is, are there ways that we can mitigate that? Can we use reusable masks and reusable gloves that we can wash after each use? Or at the very least, make sure that we don't see images like that. Exactly, reusable masks just like these um, made out of cotton. Um, or, uh, you know, you see the image, you see that um, the, the mask and the gloves in the streets, the best thing to do is make sure after you use them, if it's disposable, that it goes into the trash and not into the ocean because we have some friends. I'm just gonna flip this over. Change my camera. So now you can see animals like these. These are tide pool animals. And we always say that um, if Patrick were a real sea star, he'd probably be a bad star. <laughs> just like these uh, really fun animals. They look like they have webbing between their arms, just like a bat wing. Oh yeah, good um, job. Just like a bat wing, yeah. And so um, animals like these, I'll just keep it out of the water. Um, animals like these are affected by plastic pollution, especially by the PPE products that are um, disposed carelessly. Um, we see them in our parking lots here, we see them on the beach, and then they end up in the ocean, as Tiki said, Plastic does not biodegrade, um, it photodegrades, which means it breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces in the sun, but they're still pieces of plastic. And then you can definitely see, I'm um, trying to find a hermit crab. So you can see that they should be in a shell. Oh, there's one right down there, um, instead of a Duplo box. <laughs> awesome, so yeah, it's really important to remember that, you know, although these items are used to protect us, um, they are actually creating a lot of issues for the creatures that live in the ocean and also around the ocean. If you think about uh, disposable masks, they have these little elastic pieces that go around your ears. Those are really easy for animals to get caught up in. Um, and you know, we wanna make sure that that's not happening because we also want to make sure we're protecting the other creatures that live around us, not just protecting ourselves using these PPE items. Um, all right. so. That kind of leads us into the next topic where we wanted to look a little bit more specifically at plastic pollution in general. Um, so these three images right here are actually from uh, that season 11 episode of SpongeBob that I watched. It was called High Sea Diving. Um, and I thought it was a really interesting sort of side by side to look at this picture of the Bikini Bottom Island right next to an actual photo that was taken of the, you can see that's the Santa Monica Pier right there, after a storm. So like I mentioned earlier, the storm drains in Los Angeles lead directly to the ocean. There's nothing to catch or filter anything that goes through the storm drains. Um, so that means after a storm event, after it rains, this is what our beaches, what our local beaches look like. And this is also one of the reasons why after a big storm event, you don't wanna go swimming for at least three days in the ocean because you can get pretty sick um, some pretty yucky illnesses. So, you know, make sure you're keeping yourselves safe in that way. Um, so Jenna and Tiki, can you tell us a little bit more how plastic pollution, like we can, you know, the kind that we see here affects marine life and maybe some ways that we can prevent this from happening? 
Absolutely. So actually, I'd love to show you an art display that we have here. Um, this is called The Not So Merry Ground uh, by an artist named Marina Debris. And if you can believe it, all of that plastic on there, all of the beach toys, every single piece was actually found um, during beach cleanup. So these are all items that were discarded on our beaches that otherwise would have gone into our oceans and become more ocean pollution. Um, so as you mentioned before, if you have used a toothbrush and it was made out of plastic, um, it's still probably around. Uh, plastics have been made, uh, generated since about 1950. And since then, only about 10% of it has ever been recycled. So 90% of all the plastic, that's over 6 billion tons since 1950, is still on this planet. Whether it's in a landfill or unfortunately on land or in our oceans, um, that plastic is still having an impact. So it's important that we make sure um, we all know reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, so the most important thing we can do is to reduce, reduce our plastic footprint as much as possible and then reuse and repurpose and upcycle the things that we do have at home. And then when recycling is the last resort, try to recycle what you can. Uh, but the most important thing we can do is try to prevent that plastic that we're using in the first place from actually being made because it's also made out of fossil fuels like oil and natural gas, which are also um, things that are contributing to our climate crisis um, with our planet, making our oceans um, having a hard time staying healthy for the animals that live in it and also for, for humans as well. We get most of the oxygen that we breathe from phytoplankton, from things like algae in the ocean. And so it's important that we have a healthy ocean environment so that we also have a healthy atmosphere up on, on land too. And another thing you can do is give a hand when you can. So one of the most amazing things that we do here at Heal the Bay is we get together out there on the beach and throw awesome beach parties. They're not just any beach party, they're beach cleanup parties where we go out there and with these buckets and these gloves, we go out and we pick up some of that trash. And guess what? You don't have to be part of Heal the Bay to be able to do that. All you have to do is go out there safely and grab a friend and pick up a you know, glove and make sure you uh, don't touch anything as I say icky, sticky, or gross. <laughs> and make sure you get it inside of one of these buckets or a bag or something that you can throw away, pick up the recyclables, put them in the recyclable container. But also, if you can, try and take a little bit of information because that information actually helps us in the end get things passed like the single use bin so that way people don't use all that styrofoam and other materials that aren't so good for the ocean and also the straw bin. So that way people continue to use sing, uh, reusable straws and things like uh, reusable totes that help us all reduce, reuse, recycle, and rethink the way we use the items out there so that way we can keep some of that plastic off our beaches and out of our oceans. Awesome. That's really important to remember that there are things that we can do to help with this problem. Um, by being proactive, by you know joining one of these beach cleanups at Heal the Bay, which I personally have always wanted to do, but it has been so hard because I have worked Saturdays basically my entire life. <laughs> I've never had like a real weekend. So, um, but someday I will join you both out there on the beach and we will clean things up. Um, so I wanted to ask a fun question to you both. What is the weirdest thing that you have ever picked up in a beach cleanup? Like just the weirdest thing that you never think you would see on a beach before. Well, uh, I've done a couple of beach and river cleanups. I started out on the river crew. So what people may not know is that we don't just actually clean up the, the beaches. We have another team that actually goes into the LA River and goes out there and does a cleanup and um, analytics or research in the LA River as well. And I used to be on that team in the very beginning. And so one of the wildest things was in the LA River, was actually a uh, a shopping cart like so you can I actually kayak in certain areas of the LA River up in like Balboa Park and so as we were kayaking I'm looking and I'm seeing this metal looking like braided type of thing and it just actually allowed me to know how actually deep the LA River is because yeah this was completely submerged down and it was right side up so it wasn't the typical way that you would actually roll apart. It was sitting 
like flat side up. So it was pretty, uh, a, a little bit uh, awe striking. I was a little bit in awe, but at the same time, I was in awe of the fact that it's just a shopping cart in the middle of the river. Like no one thought to return it to where it was supposed to go. And those kinds of things cost money, not only for people to clean up, but also for the companies that are actually taking care of those carts because they're going to lose that cart. And so now they have to replace it. So there's a lot of impact that happens when we think about things like that, not just on the surface level, but more in an existential level as well. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, it's so much easier to just return the shopping cart to the caddy than taking it all the way to the LA River. Just put, just put it back in the caddy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I would say um, one of the uh, most interesting things that I found, we were doing, uh, I think it was one of our coastal cleanup days, and someone came up and they had found a message in a bottle. Um, it was in a plastic bottle, and uh, we opened it up, and it turns out that it was some folks that had written, you know, hey, if you find this, um, write to me, here's my address. And they had thrown it off the pier only the day before. <laughs> so it didn't make it quite far. But it also goes to show, you know, they were throwing a piece of plastic into the ocean that at some point would have broken down into small pieces and would have had an impact, a negative impact on the ocean, um, even though they were trying to, you know, connect with someone, hopefully somewhere across the world. Um, so good intentions, but the impact, unfortunately, was much bigger. And thankfully, it, it came right back in the very next day. So we were able to take it out. Yeah, that, that is good. You know what? Actually, I take that back. Another amazing thing that I discovered on the beach cleanup was animals. So I had, like I said, previously been in a river. And when I came to the beach uh, habitat to do the cleanups, I started discovering all of these amazing animals and getting a much closer look. And so as you're doing that, you are starting to look at how this impacts those animals as you're cleaning up and seeing that this animal is trying to like get over that piece of plastic or that fork that may have like, you know, accidentally like gored some little animal out there. <laughs> and you just start thinking about, this isn't just a place where we're walking, it's a place where animals live. So I discovered a Volovo, a Volovo, which is like a really crazy looking animal that kind of looks like a, a bottle cap off of like a plastic bottle. Um, sea jellies, uh, what are those guys? Oh, uh, rays, round rays. I saw those in mass when I went to Marina Del Rey. So yeah, that's another amazing thing, nature that you discover when you're out on these beach cleanups and river cleanups. <laughs> that's true. And it really helps to remember that this is where animals live. This is their home. And so we need to be respectful of that and make sure that, that we're not, you know, trashing their home because it's rude to do that. <laughs> I think the weirdest thing I ever found at the beach was a cast iron skillet, just like in the sand. <laughs> so weird. All right, so let's go ahead to our next slide I here. We'll talk some. Scream, like when you said, be careful. Like, you know, now he's always like, ah. Oh. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, step on plankton, tread lightly. <laughs> be nice to plankton. He gets stepped on too much. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at our next slide here. We're going to talk about, ooh, another very important issue, um, another big way that humans are impacting the world's ocean is through overfishing. Um, so this is one of, we've got some, some pictures here from one of my favorite episodes of SpongeBob called Hookie, where Patrick thinks that the carnival is in town, but it's not the carnival. It's actually just all of these fishing lures. Um, and Mr. Krabs warns SpongeBob not to play on them, um, but he doesn't listen and he gets hooked. And then at the end of the episode, Patrick gets sent back to Bikini Bottom uh, vacuum packed in a can of tuna. <laughs> so Jenna and Tiki, can you tell us about how overfishing is impacting our marine life? Absolutely. Yes. So uh, it's one thing we always tell folks too, when you go to the beach, um, the most important thing that you should leave with, or the only things you should really leave with are fun memories and trash if you find it. Um, but you know, I, even when I was a kid, I thought it was fun. I found all these really cool shells, you know, wherever I, I went to different beaches and I thought it'd be fun to take them home so I could keep that memory. But if I'm one person doing it, that's, you know, maybe a few shells. But if everybody is doing that, then we remove all those shells from the beach. We remove shells that become sand and a habitat and a home for other animals. And the same thing's happening in our ocean. Um, you know, about a billion people in the world rely on the ocean for their source of uh, protein for seafood. Um, and what we're doing is we're having, um, you know, uh, commercial fishermen um, going out there and they're taking uh, way too many fish at once from one area. And because of that, you're taking out too many at once. We 
are part of the food web. Um, and when you start taking out, just like Jenga, you start taking out pieces of that web, it becomes imbalanced. And when we have that happen, we've seen it happen in Yellowstone. When uh, the wolves were you know, taken out of that environment, you start to see too many deer. You see other animals because their predators are removed, they start taking over. Um, we have uh, an issue with kelp forests. Uh, we used to have um, beautiful, beautiful kelp forests um, all along the California coastline. And we've lost over 90% of those um, due to not only pollution, um, habitat loss, but because of overfishing. Because when we took out natural predators of sea urchins, uh, specifically even the purple sea urchins, um, those urchins don't have anything eating them, keeping their populations in check. And because of that, they continue to eat and they eat all through the kelp. And then you're left with urchin barrens, which are basically, you have sand and rocks and urchins and no other marine life. There's no diversity there. There's no, um, no nurseries, there's no animals. And so that becomes an imbalanced ecosystem and an unhealthy ecosystem. So it's really important that we have um, regulations and ways to balance and manage um, fishing that's in our ocean. So we're not taking out too many at once from certain places. And also there are certain species that are endangered or they're called keystone species because they're so important to that food web. Keystone species are usually at the top. They're usually apex predators. And when you start taking out those predators, again, that whole food web can come down. And then um, we start losing and not seeing animals that we normally would have seen there. And again, that whole ecosystem becomes unhealthy. Yeah, so it's, it's really important to remember that nature likes to be imbalanced. There's nothing in, in nature that likes to be out of balance and everything fits in in a particular way. And every single living thing in an ecosystem plays a really important role in that ecosystem, even if that role is just being food for something else. And like Jenna mentioned, if we remove some of these keystone species or predators from an ecosystem, it causes he a huge disruption. And if you look at the images we posted here, these huge nets that are used in these fishing operations, these super trawlers, some of these are big enough to hold 13 jumbo jets. Um, they're absolutely massive and we're filling them up with fish and this isn't a sustainable way um, to catch seafood. It's, we're doing it in a way that's disrupting the natural processes that we see in the ocean. Cause we're not the only things in the world that want to eat fish or that need to eat fish. There are other fish in the ocean. <laughs> it's like, that's all they can eat. They can't eat like, plant, like a carrot. <laughs> so we have to remember that we're not the only living things on the planet who use this as a resource. We have to be mindful of that. So leading from this, I don't want it to feel like we're all doom and gloom over here. I do want us no. to talk a little bit about a positive way in which humans are impacting the oceans. Um, so leading from overfishing, we want to talk a little bit about marine protected areas. Um, so some of the ways that we can um, protect marine life and our friends in Bikini Bottom. So I put this picture over here from the Club SpongeBob episode. We had a couple of fish who were going hiking through the kelp forest. So this is like the kelp forest that Jenna was just talking about. Here's a real life picture of a kelp forest. So kelp forests in the ocean are a lot like the redwood forests on land. They're, the kelp acts as like this big tree kind of, it helps to create this ecosystem and you get so much biodiversity, lots of different kinds of life that can then live in this environment. So can you tell us a little bit about how marine protected areas are benefiting our underwater friends? Right, so I'm standing here right in front of our kelp forest exhibit in our aquarium. And uh, we feature animals that are localized in the Santa Monica Bay. And just not too far from here are the Channel Islands. And part of that is Catalina Island. And part of that is this magnificent, beautiful place called the kelp forest. Now, as uh, Jenna was mentioning to you, it has a lot to do with that food web because as we know, the food web starts with green, right? The plants, trees, things like that. And in the ocean, it starts with this beautiful green algae, right? And eventually this algae will grow to be this beautiful giant kelp that only actually grows in the Pacific Ocean. That's because our water is a specific temperature that allows for that kelp to be able to grow. But if there are certain things that can happen, such as, as I was saying, overfishing, where those uh, urchins are not out there doing their job because they are what we call grazers in that food web. And so that's just like cows, they're vegetarians. They need to eat that kelp. And if somehow that kelp is disrupted by either the temperature being too hot or maybe a lot of 
kelp harvesting because they will harvest kelp for things such as food, other things like toothpaste and uh, ice cream, things like that. Or even for uh, example, cute little otters right here who were actually hunted way back in the day for their beautiful coats. And they are keystone species that actually protect that kelp forest by eating the urchin and making sure that they don't overpopulate and therefore keeping that forest balanced. Another beautiful animal that we had here that we were able to return to that beautiful kelp forest is a giant sea bass. So giant sea bass are enormous fish. They can grow up to be about uh, seven feet long and about 500 pounds. And guess what? That makes for a pretty good fish dinner for some people. But unfortunately, there were too many people making that their dinner. Now, like I said, it's not all about people doing things that are delicious or bad. They just wanted to eat. But there's a much more sustainable or a much more uh, better way of doing it. So sustainable means that we can keep making it happen over and over again rather than it just happening once or we are about to run out of it and expand or extend our uh, resources. So they uh, eventually we were able to return that giant sea bass out to its habitat after we got the permits to do so and it was healthy and big and adult enough to do that. But it returned to that marine protected area, which is just similar to like Yosemite or any one of the great state parks that we know of on land, but underneath the ocean. And in those areas, it's restricted access, meaning you can't just go riding around in your boat. You can't go hunting or fishing for certain animals out there during certain times or in some places, not at all. Also, there are very uh, high regulations and authorities that come out there and regulate those areas to monitor and enforce rules and regulations to keep our animals safe, happy, and well in those marine protected area. So make sure you go and find out where you can visit some of those because they're much closer than you think. Exactly, yeah, marine protected areas, they're important because it doesn't just protect one animal, one species, it protects an entire ecosystem. So every animal that relies on that habitat, that area um, as a nursery for protection, for food, for a home, um, they're all protected. And so uh, we start to see actually a spillover effect and you see um, more, you see more fish, you see a greater diversity of fish. And then you start to see fish migrating out of the marine protected area because there's so many of them. And then that actually balances with um, the fisheries that are in the area. So they're not removing from protected areas, but they're still able um, to sustain their practices because it's actually done in a more sustainable way. So yeah, as Tiki mentioned, they're like underwater Yosemites. They're national parks under the ocean. And about 16% of our California coastline is protected, but we definitely want to strive to have more. Um, you'll notice that most of the MPAs, especially in our bay, are centered around where we have those kelp forests, uh, tip up at the uh, Malibu and then down in Palos Verdes. Um, and that's where you see those habitats typically thriving is where they have those protections. Awesome. It's, it's so wonderful to know that there are things that we can do like creating marine protected areas to help benefit the marine creatures that live off of our coast and our, our, you know, bikini bottom friends as well. So everybody benefits from marine protected areas, not just the creatures that are living in the ocean, but we do as well, because then we get to enjoy this incredible biodiversity that, that kind of comes from protecting these areas. So I really like the idea that a marine protected area is like an underwater national park, a um, place where we can, you know, enjoy the wild and protect it and conserve it. Exactly. Our students. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> you go. I'll meet. I was just going to say, it's absolutely beautiful. I was able to go for the very first time snorkeling, never had done it in my life. And uh, we were able to take a uh, guided tour out there. So, as I said, there is limited access to the uh, kill force in certain places. You can go recreational snorkeling and scuba diving. And so, I was able to actually do that. And I can tell you for a fact, it is one of the most beautiful experiences that you will ever have to see these animals in their natural habitat as you're just floating free under that water, watching the kelp sway back and forth, seeing these beautiful animals. I got to see a two-spotted octopus. I got to see one of our, uh, like, you know, we have in here spiny lobsters. 
and it was just they're they're just humongous out there so it, it's a beautiful thing and you can really actually get out there and actually experience this and and see it for your own self with your own two eyes so yes adventure friends i love telling everyone go have adventures exactly yeah we taught um mpas to our students before and uh, one student summed it up perfectly. They said, you know, what is an MPA? And they said, if we're fish, go to field space. And that image that's uh, right under uh, the SpongeBob adventure through the kelp forest, um, that's a real picture from Anacapa Island, which is right off our coast, uh, Ventura coast, so near Channel Island. And then you can see just silhouetted so perfectly is the Garibaldi, which is actually our state marine fish for California and a very common sight um, around the kelp forest. Awesome. Thank you so much. We, we really have learned a lot today about how our actions uh, can have an impact on ocean ecosystems, um, especially like, you know, Bikini Bottom. And if we make the right choices, those impacts can actually be positive ones, like we see here with the marine protected areas. So thank you so much uh, for all of this awesome information, Jenna and Tiki. It's been a lot of fun. So this concludes the formal part of our presentation. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna open it up for questions. So remember that you can submit questions uh, through Zoom in the chat. And I'm gonna go ahead and open up my questions doc here so that I can take a look at some of the questions that y'all have been asking in the chat. Where is that document? <laughs> I just want to we remind go. you guys out there, your voice, your choice. So I tell that to my students all the time. Just because you're small doesn't, think, doesn't mean you can't think tall. So you have a voice and you have a choice and you can make better decisions about the way things are used or how and what is bought. So. Absolutely. That's a very important thing to remember because sometimes it can feel like, oh, I'm just one person. What can I do? There's a lot that you can do. Um, and hopefully that you've learned a few things that we can do uh, here today from our presentation. So let's take a look at some of these questions here. So we've got Daniel um, from Manchester ES in third grade. And Daniel wants to know, can the fish die if there is too much pollution in their habitat? Absolutely. That's just like asking, can a person get sick when there's too much trash in their house? So the same way we don't, use, we don't live in our homes with a lot of clutter and a lot of trash because it can be toxic. So there are things that can, uh, bacteria and all kinds of other things that can affect our ability to breathe, eat, and live in our habitat. And so just the same, there are things like that that can affect an animal. So even if they're not taking it in, it can be absorbed into their skin and cause them to have all kinds of skin and scale and Mammals have hair, so our dolphins and things like that, hair issues, uh, ingesting it, maybe eating it. So it could be possible that they could be either drinking oil or eating something or plastic that can get caught in their throat or something like that. Or it can actually sometimes get caught around their heads and their necks. And of course, they don't have hands, so it's really difficult for them to remove those items from their faces, their noses, their mouth, or even their throats. And it does cause them sometimes to perish or expire in their home, in their habitat. So just the same way, we don't want to clutter up our homes with trash and junk. We don't want to clutter up their homes with trash and junk. Good question. That's right. Exactly. Thank you so much. Oh, go ahead, Jenna. Oh, yeah. And I was just saying, and to build on that too, um, the plastic, the, the physical trash is a big problem. And then also the pollution that you can't really see is a problem. So as you mentioned, we are in a watershed, everything that ends up in our streets goes through our storm drains, ends up in the ocean. And what's going out there along with the, uh, the trash is also pollution like um, chemicals and waste, um, uh, sometimes from animals, sometimes from humans, um, oils, all the metal that comes off your cars every time you break, that's all getting into our water supply too. And just like, it's not safe for us to go swimming at least three days after the rainstorm, because you can get pretty sick if you swallow the water, if you have a little cut, you can get infections. That also impacts the animals too. So just like we need healthy air to breathe, we wouldn't want to be breathing in any uh, types of chemicals or bad, um, bad things like that. It also can affect the animals because they're breathing that water. So if there are chemicals and pollution in the water like that, it is impacting them too. That's right. And that kind of ties into it. So Delilah from Manchester ES also had that question was, why can you get sick? Uh, at the beach if you, you know, if you don't wait three days to go in the water. So hopefully that answered your question, Delilah. There's a lot of other things 
Like, you know, people who walk their dogs and they don't pick up the dog poop, guess where that dog poop ends up after a big storm? It ends up in the ocean. Um, yes, not fertilizer. So, a lot no. of people think it's fertilizer. Actually, compost and fertilizer has to go through a process before it actually can be used to help the plants. So please pick up your poop. <laughs> pick up your poop, y'all. All right, let's take another question here. So Joseph Karstens wants to know, are there any restoration efforts with the kelp forests? Absolutely. That's a great question. I love that you're asking that. Well, I just wanted to let you guys know I'm over here visiting with our jellies. So all of you that want to see some jellies, I know we're, we're talking about SpongeBob. So there you go. But yes, that's a great question. So yes, there are plenty of restorative efforts going on in the kelp forest and other uh, marine habitats. Because, you know, it's not just the kelp forest, it's other places like the Arctic and things like that that are also affected by human impact. And so, yes, there are all kinds of oceanographers, biographer, or, uh, biologists, marine biologists that are actually out there going and restoring. Like part of our uh, releasing the giant sea bass is considered like a restorative effort because that animal now gets out there and is able to reproduce and help that population. Also, other things are actually uh, going out and kind of cultivating kelp because kelp doesn't actually, it's not grown from a seed, it's grown from phytoplankton, which is a microorganism. And so they can actually cultivate or grow this microorganism and then introduce it into the habitat so that way it can actually grow in those beautiful places like the kelp forest. So great question, I love that. Exactly. Awesome. And there's also been um, groups like the Bay Foundation, they do uh, kelp restoration and also uh, basically like urchin relocation programs where they go into an area, just remove all the urchins that they can find so they can kind of balance that ecosystem because there still aren't enough natural predators to keep them in check. And a fun fact, humans can also be a natural predator of the urchin. Um, if any of you out there like to eat sushi, if you've ever had uni before, uni is actually sea urchin. So if you want to help the kelp forests, go eat some uni. <laughs> if you like it, you know, you don't have to eat it if you don't want to. But that's one way that you can help. Um, so we have a couple questions here that are related. Uh, so we're going to kind of lump them together. So we have one from Donovan and one from Bailey. Um, how much so, trash do you Just take? for my friends oh. who do want to go get uni, just make sure that you research it and make sure that it is sourced properly. Oh, yes. That's very important. If you If you joined me last week, um, on Thursday with uh, Dr. Bill Lute from the Natural History Museum. Remember we talked about making sure that your seafood comes from a sustainable source. You can use the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Guide to find that out as well. And don't be afraid to ask the folks at the restaurant because, you know, they can tell you also. All right, so Donovan and Bailey want to know, how much trash do you pick up at the beach cleanup and where can we learn more about joining a beach cleanup? That's a great question. So uh, we actually have been tracking all of the um, the marine debris, they call it, um, uh, since the inception of our beach cleanup, since Heal the Bay first born. So um, all of that's the marine debris uh, data tracker. And then, I mean, people pick up thousands and thousands of po uh, pounds of trash every single year, um, including even just on coastal cleanup day. We'll usually have uh, at least over 10,000 folks um, just helping out all throughout LA County and our beach lines. And then Coastal Cleanup Day is a worldwide effort. So it happens pretty much anywhere um, that you uh, call home to. But yeah, thousands and thousands of pounds of trash have been picked up over the years. Um, and we still find, uh, to this day, still some of the most common pieces of trash are still the same uh, items of trash that we were picking up even 20 years ago. And then uh, folks can get involved. Um, we're hopefully going to be bringing back our monthly cleanup soon, but we have something called Adopt a Beach where you can actually um, do community cleanups. So you can actually do a cleanup right in your own uh, neighborhood, in your own community, because again, we're in a watershed. Everything that comes from inland, even miles and miles east of LA, ends up into our bay, into the ocean at some point. Um, so helping to keep that trash from at the source, from getting down to the water is really important. Um, but you can also organize your own uh, local cleanups just anywhere you are. Anytime you see any trash that's outside on the ground, it doesn't belong there. <laughs> so you can do your part by um, helping to keep um, your community clean. And that also helps keep our ocean clean. Awesome. So I just wanted to take a moment to spotlight Tiki's video because she's showing some pretty cool creatures here uh, from the <laughs> aquarium. I saw that beautiful leopard shark and I just love them so much. I've got one tattooed on my leg because they're just one of my favorites. And there's Larry the lobster right there. <laughs> yes, yes. So yeah, leopard sharks are amazing creatures. They get to be about five foot six in length. 
Um, and this is a California spiny lobster. You will only find these guys on the Pacific Coast line. And then also featured in here, if I can find my little friend, we have, there it is, our state fish, that beautiful orange fish over there is called a Garibaldi. And this isn't a clown fish, it's actually a flag rock fish, which is another fish that you'll find. Now, here's a very interesting specimen right here. So looking at this creature right here, doesn't seem too unassuming, right? Well, this is actually the most dangerous creature in the entire aquarium. This is a scorpion fish. Scorpion fish actually have very toxic little ribs or nubs on the back of, on their little fins right there. So uh, our handlers have to be very, very cautious and careful when they're cleaning the tanks in order to avoid touching that animal right there. Uh, also, that is another beautiful rockfish right there. So as you can see, these animals are very vibrant and beautiful. Right down there is our cleanup crew of the ocean. That is a sea cucumber. And nice. yeah, they do just what they sound like. They eat the sand and it goes in a lot more dirty than it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Thanks for sharing some of those cool creatures that we find in the kelp forest. So for our last question, I'm just going to take this one just in the interest of time. So Harry Lamont wants to know, are there any kelp forests near Los Angeles that we can visit? And the answer to that is absolutely. The kelp forest is the main ecosystem that we have off the coast here in Southern California. So if you want to get an idea of what the kelp forest looks like, you can actually visit the Heal the Bay Aquarium underneath the Santa Monica Pier where Jenna and Tiki are right now. Or like Tiki got the opportunity to do, you can go snorkeling off the coast and you can actually see the real kelp forest and all of its beauty and all of its glory. So yes, there are kelp forests near Los Angeles. Go out there and like Tiki said, go have an adventure and visit them. So it is 1146, y'all. We I had so much fun learning about all of the ways that we can impact uh, marine creatures and the residents of Bikini Bottom, both good and bad, right? So again, it all depends on the, cho the choices that we make. So I would like to say thank you so much to uh, Jenna and Tiki over at Heal the Bay. I hope that y'all had as much fun as I did. Um, and I also want to make sure that I, <laughs> let's see here. I want to thank Nickelodeon as well, again, for their support. Um, and with their support, we were able to make these webinars happen. Um, there's plenty of more Science of SpongeBob to come. So on Thursday, we're having our next webinar. So we hope that you join us again at 11 a.m. Uh, we're going to be hanging out with Dr. Austin Hendy from the Natural History Museum, and he's going to be talking about prehistoric bikini bottom and what that's like. So if you want more Science of SpongeBob, you can visit nhm.org slash science of SpongeBob. And we have activities and we have um, videos and more events coming up soon. So thank you all so much. I had a blast. I hope that you had fun. Um, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Come on, baby. Thank you, everyone. Twelve four. We can't wait to see you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yeah, and you can always learn more at uh, healthebay.org if you want to learn how you can uh, uh, participate and create your own cleanup, or if you want to learn more about our aquarium. And definitely come swim by for a visit. Thanks, friends. <laughs>